So what we want to do today is talk about horn sections and rehearsal techniques with the horns. And next time we're going to talk about rhythm section and working with the rhythm section, making that all work. But uh, mm -hmm. things for the horns. Now, did you, th this would change maybe how we handle things. Did, did you have a chance to read in like chapter two, three, four, five right in there? Let's see. I, I, you know, I, I was finishing up the uh, like twenty and twenty-one, and I have, and then I was looking at. So I've I've read them in the past, but I haven't read them recently. The first couple okay. Of yeah. Okay. Well, I kind of. I started out like, okay, here's a chapter on sax, here's a chapter on trombone, here's a chapter on trumpet, and then I realized, no, I think it's going to be better if I change this so that we take care of general topics that reply to all the horns, yeah, and then some specific topics. But uh, uh, one of the things that it, it goes without saying, we don't really need to talk about this, but you need to teach tone production. <laughs> Even in the jazz band, you got to teach tone production, which means yeah. what? basic embouchure, breath support, oral cavity, mm -hmm. <clears throat> and using air. Uh, I find that very few people in the schools use much air. I mean, even in synthesis, I have to press them for this at first, and then after a while, they kind of get more used to it. But it's like, <clears throat> you, you know, this, this piece of metal right here eats air for breakfast, lunch, and dinner. And you people are starving the poor things to death. <laughs> Feed it some air, yeah. and then I and then I, you know, and, and playing with a little air, and then playing with a lot of air. And you, you've heard me playing in the last minute or two, and you know that I'm putting a lot of air through the horn. <laughs> right. Definitely. But the first problem is getting the pro kids to play with enough air, uh, and then look at the third big horn problem: percussiveness. Yeah. We were just talking about that. We just talked about that. The fourth big horn problem, decay in all the wrong places. And see, if you're going, ba, and then I cut with the tongue, decay is in a bad place. Mm -hmm. And if I'm playing, and, and you know the, how a person handles a long note really reflects a lot about where their maturity is as a musician. And I think in the church, we, maybe we get a little bit of, when I taught, when I was a branch president of the MTC for four years, and I, and I, I started seeing this at that point. It's like, okay, I think actually we breed this into everybody because we say, because I have been given much, I too must give. Be that, you know, well, what about that long note, you know? <laughs> Nobody goes, I too must give. Be not. <laughs> right. <laughs> But, but how you handle that long note has a lot to do with your maturity as a musician. And if you just let it die out like that and it's decaying, there should be no decay on that note until right on the end of the note. I too must give. Right on the end of the note, give. There's a little roundness. I'm talking classically now. There's yeah. a little roundness that comes on the end, but it, it first goes up before it goes down. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and how you handle this long I'm always bugging my band about this. And you'd think, well, these are pretty strong musicians. They should be, well, I have to push them for it, believe me. Yeah. I, I've been known to say to my trumpet section, folks, until further notice, there is no such thing as a decay. I don't <laughs> want to hear any decay, no diminuendo, nothing that tapers the note, no decay anywhere. If I need it somewhere, I'll tell you. <laughs> yeah. Because trumpet players are notorious for this. <laughs> I don't know, maybe it's part of saving chops, you know, it's like, <laughs> I don't really believe that because it's the air that saves your chops. You want to have more chops endurance on a brass instrument. You keep your air under it so the air is doing the work instead of your mouth has to do the work. <laughs> yes, absolutely, absolutely. <laughs> so, uh, anyway, that's what that's about. And then an effective tone production on some exercise. You know, I have this on a YouTube video, but unfortunately... I think my video camera kind of compressed, you know, the sound got louder and so it compressed it down a little bit. And you, you just don't hear the, the stark difference that I heard in the room when you look at the video. Yeah. But I did have the band do this and this is what I have them do. It's like, okay, band, we got this. Ba, ba, bow, 
bop, bop, bo -dang, bop, something like that. All right, let's blow that with Aerostream. And I have the band blow with the Airstream like this quite a lot. Mm -hmm. And I'm looking for articulation besides how the air is working. Now, if, I, if they blow enough, they're going to start hyperventilating. Mm -hmm. And I'll often will say to them, are you hyperventilating? No. Then you're not doing it right. <laughs> I need you to take it. If you have to breathe every two or three notes, do it. But I need you to get some air flowing, you know. Yeah. And this is this does magic tricks. I mean, you would be amazed if you could hear this in the room. You can find it on the video, but it's not as stark, like I say. But okay. but it's like we have the band blow with the airstream. And am I getting tongue cutoffs? And is the pressure constant? You know, I can do a lot of stuff like that with the band with with blowing with the yeah. airstream, and I'll have them do that. Well, actually. I'm sorry, I skipped a step. First, I have them play it. It usually sounds kind of wimpy. It's usually a little out of tune. It usually has uh, not not really solid articulations. I mean, it's just kind of weak. And mm -hmm. then I'll say, okay, let's sing those notes. Now, if you need to, play your instrument and get the first note. Mm -hmm. ba, ba. Okay, ready? Here we go. We're going to sing the, the thing. And I'm, ba, 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 And we'll actually sing the pitches. Mm -hmm. And I'll say, Okay, great, but we're sharp on the top note. Fix the pitch. Ba 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 ba. No, ba ba. <laughs> and and if there's pitch problems, so I want them to sing it in tune, because that's part of it. But I'll work on that to get them to sing it. Then I'll say, okay, now let's do the pitches, but with the air strain. <laughs> I actually want the pitches. Mm -hmm. Airstream, you know, and then I want to hear air, a lot of air, and that means I'm taking a lot of full breaths, and then I'm hearing the tongue cut off and all that stuff, and then I say, okay, now rest a second, because after, if they're doing it right, they'll start to hyperventilate. So I give them a second to, okay, rest a minute. All right, now we're going to do it again. This time, have your horn ready, and as soon as we're done blowing it, we're going to play it. It's a magic trick. I mean, it's dumbfounding. All of a sudden. The air happens, the sound happens, intonation gets way better, mm -hmm. balance gets a lot better. A thousand problems are fixed when you get the air going that way. Quiet. Yeah. Yeah. It's amazing. And and that's what that next thing is about right there. Then we're talking about saxophone problems. I think you know that the saxophones should be using jazz mouthpieces, right? I do know that. And the biggest problem is okay, so the lead alto and the lead tenor are studying privately that's why they're lead alto and lead tenor <laughs> and their teacher has helped them get a jazz mouthpiece but your second alto and your second tenor probably aren't studying privately they haven't had that help and they're probably trying to play on their classical mouthpieces then the baritone player has a jazz mouthpiece because he got that from the school the school owns that you know <laughs> <laughs> and how? what kind of balance are you going to get out of this? Because, see, the classical mouthpiece is not souped up for power. And, right. it's, and you don't want them playing their jazz mouthpieces in your concert band either. They right. need to have two different setups. So <clears throat> having a, a uniformity there. And I've had some schools. For example, so a few years ago, Kurt McKendrick was teaching at Lone Peak at the time. He called me and says, I want to get a whole set of Ernie Northway mouthpieces. Well, I probably wouldn't go that way. I'd probably get different mouthpieces for the tenors than I got for the altors, whatever. But, but he got, for the school, he got a whole set of Ernie Northway mouthpieces. Then if you won that chair, you could check out that mouthpiece. Mm, yeah. <laughs> and that way he always made sure that everybody had a chess mouthpiece because sometimes the kids just can't afford it and the prices have become pretty ridiculous. Yeah. In a jazz mouthpiece. You can, the cheapest, decent jazz mouthpiece is probably about 180 bucks, you know? Yeah, that is. And the really good ones have gone up to like five fifty, six fifty for the tenor and the bearing. It's like, are you kidding? <laughs> that's just crazy, but that's where we're at. Yeah. Sometimes it's really worth that investment from the school to, to have that around. Yeah. You were in my woodwind class and you know we talked about mouthpiece pitches and stuff and that's Yeah, yeah, we did. About yeah. Do you understand what subtone is? Um <clears throat> For a saxophone. I I mean I've I've heard it I've uh, I when I was watching one of your videos a while ago. Oh okay. Sometimes sometimes the subtone will actually even be written on the part as a subtone. 
one, yeah. But but subtone is when you pull your jaw back. <laughs> styles to play with subtone. It's also kind of common in uh, straight ahead jazz styles to play with subtone from about G on down. So you're playing not subtone up here. You go down in there and it becomes subtone. Yeah. Okay. That's really common. It comes from pulling your jaw back a little bit and then slightly loosening and you do have to kind of practice it to get that feel. The mouthpieces, like the one I'm playing, for example, are, are made to get that laser edge sound. You know, they, they have a certain configuration in the bore that helps to speed up the air and cause it to sizzle a little bit more. And, you know, that's okay for a solo sound. But in your section, that can get in the way because I tell my section sometimes, how can you blend five laser beams? <laughs> they just don't blend properly. And you gotta you got to warm it up. Take the edge out of your sound. Open up your oral cavity. Darken it up. Take the edge off your sound a little bit. Warm it up because a more blunt sound is going to balance and blend across mm -hmm. the section a lot better. So that's what that's about. And then trombones. Uh, you, you know that trombones should be... Um, I'm, wait, before I leave saxophone, do you have any other thoughts, of, uh, questions, or anything about saxophone? I should say this, uh, I, this isn't in the book, but, or maybe it is somewhere, but the, um, there's a role, there's roles within the saxophone uh, section. You've got the first alto is your lead player. Yeah. I've, I've seen some schools and even Caleb does this with the super band sometimes where like the second tenor player is the lead leader of the section. He's the section leader. That's very strange. The lead alto player should always be the section leader in my mind. I would never, tr I'd never farm it out to somebody else. Yeah. But he'll farm it out to his strongest player. Mm -hmm. Well, I don't know if you're dealing with immature kids, maybe that helps. But it isn't how a section works. <laughs> and, and so the lead alto player is the leader of the section. And he should take responsibility for making sure that section is happening. Mm -hmm. In fact, when I was in high school, I actually... I was lead alto my junior and senior. I played lead tenor in my sophomore year. Junior and senior, I played lead alto. I I actually, I probably had a little more power than the average student because our band director didn't have much going on. I mean, he, he was a bass player on the Utah Symphony. He had no, no knowledge about jazz and no desire to have anything to do with it. <laughs> and so... Because of the of his predecessor, we actually had jazz band seventh period when most of the bands around the the city were like meeting at seven thirty or earlier, like six thirty a.m. and stuff like that. You know, and we actually had jazz band seventh period. I mean, this is a luxury. But he would go out during seventh period, check his mail, return phone calls, walk the halls. He usually wasn't even in the room. <laughs> He would stand in front of the band at high school assemblies so that he could look like he's doing his job to the administrators, you know. But right. <laughs> and my senior year, we went to the, that was the first year they held the, the, the All-State Jazz Festival in Utah. Oh, okay. My senior year. And we went to that All-State Jazz Festival, me leading the band. I kicked off the tempos, announced the tunes. We had no band director in front of us. Mm -hmm. And we won by the way. Wow. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, that's just kind of how it was. So that's why I say I probably had a little more power than the average yeah. student would have been. I was the president of the band and the lead trumpet player was my best friend and he was the vice president of the band. <laughs> and, and we went after, I mean, we had a bass trombone player quit and it was the students who went out and said, we need a bass trombone player. We're going to get somebody that can do this. You know, the band director could care less. It's just how it was. <laughs> so... <laughs> And that was actually kind of good for for me and my teaching in a way because I actually took a lot of responsibility for the band. <laughs> but, uh, but I told the section sax section I said if you don't, if you can't come to my house on Saturday mornings for a sectional you can't be in the section. <laughs> and we we held sectionals, <laughs> but see I took that lead alto role seriously because it's my job to make sure that we're 
functioning as a section and to make sure that everybody's doing the same articulation I am, we're doing the same kinds of things I am, you know, yeah. <laughs> matching me as the lead player. So on. Cool, cool. So here, here's one question about saxophone. Um, uh, what, what's your opinion on terms of uh, when, like starting on alto, switching to tenor, switching to very, should they, should high school saxophone players have experience on all of them or should they focus on one? Almost always the kids start on alto just because it's smaller and they can carry it easier when they're a little kid. Yeah. Definitely. The tenor is quite a bit more to carry. Yeah. Once in a while, and I don't know what it is currently, but I remember a few years back when both at Orm High and American Fork High, it was about the same situation. They had about 30 saxophone players, 30 alto players, and one tenor player. <laughs> <laughs> well, what are you going to do with 30 out the you can't deal with that you know i mean we talked about this in woodwind workshop class but you gotta adapt, you gotta get some of those kids to adapt to bass clarinet and contra bass clarinet and maybe even bassoon or uh, yeah. you, know, <laughs> you gotta you, you can't use 30 alto players in your band <laughs> but yeah. uh, i think so i think it's common for the kids to have for us to have be weighted more heavier on alto than on on tenor mm -hmm. but for example i have a student at corner canyon high school and he was playing alto last year he told me recently, in fact, we had a lesson yesterday afternoon, and he had the school tenor sitting there, and he said, yeah, I'm told that I'm going to be playing tenor next year. I said, oh, that's great. Get some tenor experience. Yeah. And he, I think he's got a good attitude about it. But for a lot of kids, that's that's kind of a hard, it's just not a given that you can play the tenor well if you play the alto, you know. Right. But it, okay, so you know the fingerings. But it's not the same blowing. It's not the same to get the same the sound and the intonation and everything. It takes a little bit of weathering in. Uh -huh. And but I, I I do I think you have if you don't have them already you've got to adapt them over. And I would, uh, in the high school level especially, I would definitely have no problems, no qualms with saying, okay, great, you're playing tenor and you're playing Barry. Yeah. In my, in my concert band, you know, and then in the jazz band. Let's have somebody else maybe play the tenor. You, you both, you two are playing tenor, and you're playing Barry or whatever. And you have to, you have to have them do that, you know. And of course, the school probably owns those instruments because the kids won't, and, the, and you can farm them out. And hopefully, you got some mouthpieces that are decent for them. But, mm -hmm. but I, I don't have any problem with that. However, you do have to get the kids to live with the instrument a bit. And yeah. I had this experience with a bass trombone player years ago. He actually is now on the physics faculty at BYU, but okay. he was playing bass trombone and synthesis and I just I'd had a couple of really great bass trombone players and I was just not happy with what he was giving me and I talked to him about it and I hauled him into my office and worked with him a little bit and still didn't feel like I was getting what I needed out of it and finally said hey look Scott if I arranged it would you go up and take a, a trombone a bass trombone lesson with one of the best bass trombone players in Salt Lake yeah okay sure I'd do that so I arranged it he went up on a Saturday morning on Monday I saw him and I said so how'd the lesson go uh Okay. I said, what do you mean? Didn't, didn't you have a good lesson? Well, yeah, it was okay. We actually spent from 9 to 12. He said, I was there three hours. I said, wow. <laughs> I said, uh, but he said, the main thing I got out of the lesson was that if I'm going to play bass trombone in the band, I need to practice the bass trombone. <laughs> okay. I mean, he was doing all his practice on tenor trombone. Yeah. And, and he was even... He was winning. I mean, he was a good player. He was winning uh, like UMTA mm -hmm. stuff, you know, on the trombone, you know, solo stuff. But the only time he ever saw the bass trombone was in the rehearsal. <laughs> <laughs> well, it wasn't working. And I've said that same kind of thing. I've told that story and then to a Barry player. I want to have to adapt somebody to Barry. It's like, okay, you can't just practice alto and then play Barry in the band. I need you to practice the Barry regular, regularly. Yeah, so you have to get him doing that. But it is a problem because we usually really are alto heavy. <laughs> yeah. But uh, it's good experience for the kids. And I don't have any problem with getting them adapted over. It almost seems like I told you my story, but I, I got an alto, you know, when I was in the ninth grade, started playing in the jazz band. Mm -hmm. And I got, I was, I'd heard the high school jazz band at the Fathers and Sons night at the junior high that came over and played for the, and it's like, I was thrilled by it. I just wanted so bad to play in that varsity jazz band. Mm -hmm. So I practiced really hard, I thought, all summer, you know, and alto. And then I got over to the I got over to the school and they said, Oh, you're a sophomore. You can't play in the varsity jazz band. What? 
you know, put your name on this list for the junior varsity tryouts. So I put my name on there, and it was about a week away. Anyway, we weren't there yet. A day or two later, when the band director caught me in the hall, and he said, my first tenor player quit in the varsity jazz band. Would you be interested in auditioning for it? Yeah. I would love to. <laughs> he said, you do play tenor, don't you? Sure. Sure. I've never, touched one. I've never even ever touched one. <laughs> But I said, but I don't have one of my own. He said, well, you can you can check one out from the school. So come in after school, pick up the tenor, take it home overnight, come back tomorrow morning and play for me. We'll see if we can put you in the band. Yeah, so I went after school, got the tenor, but I missed, my, I missed my first bus, so I was waiting for my second bus, you know. And so I took it out and started playing around with it in the band room. And I started playing stuff that I'd been playing on the alto all summer. Mm -hmm. And I didn't. he was in his office, but he had the door closed, and it never even occurred to me that he could hear me. Uh -huh. but I was just playing around out there, you know, and then getting ready, waiting around for my second bus when he came out of the band room and he said, you're in. <laughs> <laughs> <That's great. laughs> so I played tenor that first year. I'm really grateful I had that experience, actually. Yeah, very cool. Yeah. And, and I mean, really to do anything professionally these days, you almost have to be able to play alto tenor and at least in soprano, baritone, possibly. Mm hmm yeah, that makes sense. Yeah. So I don't think it's bad for the kids to get that experience. Yeah. I'd... And some of them will start to say, you know, I love the tenor. And they'll start to specialize in tenor. That's a good thing. Right. Yeah. <laughs> so uh, on, the... On, the, on the flip side, if I have like a freshman come in who, who has decided that they prefer tenor, is there any reason... You know, if, if they if they want to move on to the college level or keep playing, is there any reason to say, no, you got to make sure you have some experience with alto too, or if they just stick on tenor, uh, is that going to work? We actually do that at the college level where they come in as a tenor player, and it's like, you know, the most important alto, most uh, important classical literature is alto. You've got to get some alto experience, and we'll, we'll, we'll push them to do that there. But I don't think you need to do that in the high school, really. Okay. Yeah. Okay. That makes sense. That's yeah. kind of what I, that's kind of what I thought, but I just, <laughs> yeah. obviously you have a little bit more informed perspective than I do. So yeah. the other roles, of course, your lead tenor player tends to be your primary band solo. I mean, he usually gets more solos than anybody else in the band. There's just mm -hmm. a lot of solos are written on first tenor. So you want your guy that can improvise or at least has some good potential there to be on your first tenor chair. Yeah. Um, the second alto, I want somebody that can play strong though, because I want them to push the lead alto. I want them to. I, I, it's so. I, I have this. I kind of developed this ability where if I close my eyes and listen to a section. I can say, "There's a hole right there where the second alto is supposed to be. You know? mm -hmm. There's a hole where the second tenor should be." And I can. No, I need. I need sound here. You know, and your second tenor part is probably the hardest part in the whole section. You need a pretty good player to play. I mean, it's kind of the garbage part. You get all the garbage notes, which means that it's popping around all over the place, and sometimes it goes kind of extreme on the low side and stuff. Yeah. Which, by the way, I wouldn't want my second tenor player to um, play subtone mm. uh, down there. If they're playing solos, okay, you can use subtone. But if he's playing in a section and he's got low stuff, it's not going to be heard in a section. If he subtones, it's not going to balance the section. Yeah. That makes sense. So I don't want him subtoning. The berry player, I want somebody with a lot of beef on that chair. <laughs> I often tell him, if you've ever played too loud, I'll let you know. Yeah. Give me all you got. You know? <laughs> and once in a while, I said, okay, that's enough. <laughs> but right. not very often. It's the same with the bass trombone. You know, I'll let you know if there, if I need any less ever. Just blow. <laughs> I used to do a lot of bass clarinet. Uh, I'm actually going to play bass clarinet on a recording session in a week. Okay. Now I got my bass clarinet out here. Yeah. <laughs> but, uh, I did a lot of bass clarinet, and I played under people like Lucas Foss and Robert Shaw, Sergio Commissioni, some of the great conductors. And I always played strong. And it was if if anybody wanted less, they go, I say, great, no problem. And I, I just hated to have that's I'd much rather be in that situation than having somebody saying, come on, man, come on. some kind of wimp. I need, you know, I'm behind my back. Cat can't play at all. You know, I really need some sound on that instrument. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you don't want to be there. That makes sense. No, I always played strong and then I figured if they didn't want me so much. But when you're playing low, it's harder to play too loud. 
Mm-hmm. Yeah, <laughs> definitely. Yeah, and you want a lot of bottom on your band. So I, anyway, yeah. That's kind of the some of the roles in the sax section. There's a lot more information in the book and the videos about that. But and and the one-on-one sax, the one-on-one section technique works for saxophones, trumpets, trombones. Did you watch the video with that? The one, the one-on-one section. Technique? Or have you ever seen me do it? The one-on-one. Um, do you mean? In like, other words, no. let's, let's say we've got a sax solo. Mm-hmm. And we play, and I've got a video that does this with the synthesis okay. section, so you kind of get a feel for this. But uh, uh, I'll say, uh, and I think it says one-on-one technique on the video, but it'd be, it's a really good technique. I uh, have section player play with the second alto. Okay, scale of one to ten, how well are we together? Mm-hmm. Are we rhythmically together? Are we articulating the same together? Are we accenting the same places together? Are mm-hmm. we in tune together? You know? <laughs> everything about it you want everything about it to be together because yeah. well, that's what it means to be a section player and follow your lead player is you try to match your lead player in every way uh then i have the lead alto player play with the first tenor how are we okay you you sound like a shadow you got to drive a little bit more you know uh, you're out of tune on that part you know you're not playing your dots as short as the lead alto or you're not playing as crisp as the lead alto or whatever and and then okay lead alto on second tenor Oh, yeah, this often has octaves. Yeah, you're not in tune on those octaves. Let's tune those octaves up, you know. And yeah. Okay. Sometimes the berry does have octaves, too. So a lot of, one, one way of writing for the saxes is to have the berry play exactly the same notes as the lead alto, which puts him down an octave. Yeah, okay. But sometimes the berry's playing lower roots and stuff, and the second tenor sometimes gets that octave to the lead alto. So that's got to be in tune if it's ever going to work, you know. Yeah. And then I'll have the lead alto play with the baritone sax. And you find out where the little discrepancies are, and you, and you get everybody gravitating to the lead alto. You say, okay, now let's try it together. And yeah. it's like a magic trick again. It's amazing how much better the section sounds, how much more of a team. It's so much better than one ever man for himself. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. And that's the same lead trumpet with second trumpet, lead trumpet with third trumpet, lead trumpet with fourth trumpet. And if there's a fifth, lead trumpet with fifth. And same in the trombone. Yeah, that, that's a really great section solving, problem solving issue in the section. Now, trombones, uh, the biggest issue there is horns. You know that a lot of times your lead, your lead trombones and, and even your second trombone often are playing fairly high, just like your lead trumpet. And if they're playing an orchestral bore horn, you know, uh, with an F attachment, they're going to have a hard time getting up into that range. <laughs> Yeah. Uh, ideally, they play on a small bore horn, like a Con 2B. You know, it's a very small bore horn. That really helps with those high things. But most kids don't have the bread to have two trombones, and so they have more of a, most of them have a more of an orchestral trombone. This is another uh, very good thing for a school to think about if you're buying instruments for your school, is to have a couple of small bore trombones that you can check out if you need to to your top two trombone players. <laughs> yeah. I think on the third part, and if you have five parts, the fourth part, I, I think the, the third and fourth parts can use F attachment and a larger bore. It works out pretty well. And of course, your bass trombone, you really need a real bass trombone to play the bass trombone part, not trying to be playing that on an F attachment. You know? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. So it's it's tricky to get that. And there's a similar thing there that your lead trombone player is, is like the leader of the section. Everybody should gravitate to him. The second trombone player is often the most featured soloist in the trombone section. However, the lead trombone player can get solos too. It's rare to see solos on the third part or the bass trombone part. Mm-hmm. And then you got your bass trombone that needs to put that bottom on just like the baritone sax in the sax section. And of course, he's gonna have a much larger bore horn. Uh, in the book, I have a lot of stuff on mouthpieces. Th- those are in a lot of, that's with a lot of consultation with professional players and what they really would recommend, you know, to, what the gear is that they should play. And this is particularly important in the trumpet section when you've got guys that have to play high. Yeah. Like, yeah. they're trying to play on a mouthpiece that's way too, they've got a big cup and a big bore. And, there's no way they're going to get those high notes and last very long, you know. <laughs> but yeah. the lead, the real lead trumpet players have a lead mouthpiece. It's got a shallow bore. It's an, uh, I mean, a shallow cup, and it's a narrower bore, and they can 
they can get up higher easier so they can last longer and there's a lot of stuff on an appendix i think it's appendix b or one of those i think it's appendix b yeah appendix b yeah i just put the yeah there's a lot of information there that can be helpful on lead mouthpieces those poor trumpet players i mean it's rare that they're confined to a high c or a d you know you mm -hmm. hope you look for charts that don't go above a high c or a d <laughs> <laughs> but very often they're e, e e flat e f and even f sharp g and you know if they're the professional type charts even a's and stuff i mean they're way up there yeah yeah and i haven't had a lead player now for a couple of years that could play higher than an f sharp well actually g i've had a g a, a couple of times a few times but it's a challenge and i remember in, in the early days i had evan bateman playing lead trumpet Evan teaches at Olympus High School now, but uh, he was, uh, he he only had a high D, you know, he couldn't really play higher than a high D at first. He's an amazing lead player now, and he can play those scream things like crazy, you know, he's built his range a lot. At the time, I actually re-scored, re-voiced some of the chords so that I could have the lead trumpet player not playing so high. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, if they're playing a high D strong, it sounds high. Yeah. And if you have to go into a high F, that's a lot for a young kid, especially. Oh, yeah. 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 And you know something about building range. So. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> There's a book for trumpet called 37 Weeks to a Double C. <laughs> <laughs> it goes through a routine and stuff. But different people have their different ways of trying to deal with this. But it's a fact of life that your jazz shirts ask for a lead trumpet player that's got some chops. This is one of the reasons that I always try to have five trumpets, although this last year I only got to have four. And that was a, a little mm -hmm. tougher, but I really like to have five trumpets because that way a lot of the charts only have four parts. Yeah, I can rotate people in and out and give them a rest. Mm -hmm. That makes sense. Plus I can, um, well, I'll double, let's say it only has four parts and I have five players. I'll double the fourth part when I'm just reading and stuff like that but usually not in the concert oh, it depends on the strength because that fourth part needs strength if you don't have a lot of strength there having two people on it isn't all bad <laughs> right. yeah. and i'll double it sometimes but having the lead trumpet player be able to trade around just a little bit and maybe sit out uh after a, a challenging tune he sits out and the next tune is not so challenging and one of the other guys can handle it and then he comes back in on the next tune and he's had a rest. That that kind of stuff really helps. Yeah, makes sense. You do have about. to worry about that. <laughs> and in both your concert programming mm -hmm. rehearsals. Yeah. Yep. Because in the rehearsal, if you you got a chart that requires a high F and that's the first chart you do in the rehearsal, that's probably not gonna be a good thing. <laughs> You know, it'd be better to, to warm up with something a little easier and get to get everybody playing before you ask for the higher notes. <laughs> yeah, yeah, absolutely. And, you know, organizing a rehearsal can actually be a lot like organizing for a concert because if you play hard, 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 hard stuff all in a row, you know, that not only wears on chops, but it also kind of wears on mental outlook and stuff you know i'll yeah. try to actually organize a rehearsal with some contrast so mm -hmm. like we do a couple of charts and you know, i mean we do a, a swing chart that's pretty strong and then we do a latin chart and then i'll do a ballad yeah. or i'll do a something that's a lot easier you know where we can kind of kick back just a little bit and then i'll come back and do something a little harder again you know but you got to kind of balance that through your rehearsal mm -hmm. yeah I think, though, it's important in your rehearsal that you end with something strong. Uh, I mean, you end with something where the band feels strong, where they feel successful. Successful, yeah. Uh, so I try not to, like, play, okay, this is our last tune, we're doing the ballad. That's not going to let people go out excited. Right. Yeah. You know? Yeah. So I'll I'll deliberately pace so that the last tune is something a little more exciting. And if it doesn't look like we're going to get through it all, I'll skip Let's just skip over to the last letter and let's play the end of it. And let's, let's, okay, let's play it one more time, play it strong, so that it feels like we ended strong. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and, uh, there's a lot of psychology to how you structure that rehearsal, I think. Yeah, I think there is. That makes sense. And part of it's psychology and part of it is just thinking about chops.
yeah, how you're gonna how you're gonna give the appropriate amount of rest appropriate amount of rest it's, it's it's hard because these are demanding things for both your lead trumpet to a little lesser extent but your high your lead trombone can be playing fairly high too yeah yeah and so can your second trumpet and your second trombone yeah, <laughs> yeah. on the chart absolutely yeah uh, if you're really smart, you look for the materials that feature your strengths and that don't require a, a, a showing of your weaknesses. Right. <laughs> you know what I mean? <laughs> you know who would mass with that. Where are you from? Were you from Utah? Yeah, yeah, I'm from Cache Valley area. Okay. Where are you teaching now? Uh, it's just too long ago anyway, but Woods Cross High School used to be like the top band in the state. I mean, 10 years in a row, they won the state jazz festival. Mm -hmm. And it was because of a guy there named Steve Richens. Okay. Unfortunately, he left and went to Viewmont High School and became an assistant principal. <laughs> <laughs> but unfortunately, even more so, he got liver cancer and died at age 52. Oh, no. But uh, he had an uncanny ability to program to feature the strengths of the band. If he had a great sax section, he'll find a chart with a really good sax solo in it and stuff. If he mm -hmm. had a bad trumpet section, he'll try to find stuff that doesn't feature that and doesn't sh point that out so much, you know, <laughs> etc. And he'd go after his best soloist, and he just had the ability to do that. Do you know Todd Todd Campbell? Yeah. He teaches at Woodcross now. Mm -hmm. He was in that band with Steve Richens. Oh, really? Okay. Yeah. 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 I didn't know that. Yeah. I, ju I judged that band a number of times. I remember Todd being a, a student in there at the time. <laughs> and I paid attention to him a little bit because his brothers were playing in synthesis. So. <laughs> Jeff and Greg. <laughs> cool. Anyway. Uh, I didn't mention vibrato. This is another thing I've listed here, too. But vibrato is something that you would normally not use in a unison section because vibrato in unison sounds like intonation issues right <laughs> uh, usually i would just make a rule no vibrato if you're in unison if you're in harmony then the lead player sets the pace on what kind of vibrato and then the older styles the section players all try to match the vibrato that the lead player sets out in the newer charts it's very common for the lead player to be the only one that ever uses any vibrato and the section players never use any vibrato okay I don't remember if I wrote all that in there or not. <laughs> Hopefully. Yeah, it seems like most of the same. That, but, uh, yeah. that next chapter has to do with intonation, and I, I can tell you that you cannot have a good product and be out of tune. And I think you know this. But it, it, no matter how many other good things the band might be doing, you're like totally undermined by bad intonation. You know, just totally sabotages everything <laughs> yeah. so i think you have to worry about intonation you know my experience is <clears throat> the biggest key to that is just get worried about it get the kids worried about it get them bothered about it when everybody starts thinking about it and worrying about it it just gets better yeah that makes sense <laughs> you can do some other kinds of things and, and i mentioned a number of those things in here um but honestly the biggest key is to take care of business. If it's not in tune, hey, I need the, the you two are playing together and you're not in tune. Let me hear you play together one note at a time. Next note. If that note's not working, let's find the pitch on that. Start again. Next. Yeah, okay, good. Next note. And I'll have them play one note at a time and tune it. Yeah. Sometimes I have the whole band do that. Yeah. One note. Just play one note at a time and tune. Find out where you got to put yourself. Jazz chords are far more difficult to play in tune than in the concert band most of the time. Oh, yeah. Mm -hmm. Once in a while you can have some very complex chords in the concert band, but most of the time they're more triadically based and they're easier to hear where you don't have so many half-steps, rubs, and everything. But in the jazz band you're going to hear a lot of half-step rubs. and Yeah. Challenging. And, why, and by the way, if you do have two, home, two parts in half-steps, they try to gravitate toward each other. I always try to get them to spread when they have a half step. That always helps the intonation. Mm -hmm. But there's nothing secret about that. I mean, it's all the same stuff as if you're working in concert band. You just have to worry about it. I don't know if I told you about 
<laughs> Curtis Winters. You know, Curtis is teaching at uh, uh, Orem Junior High. Mm -hmm. And he played trombone and synthesis years ago. And he's a pretty good improviser, pretty good player. And he actually took some private lessons with me, too, for a while. And, and then I judged his band. This is a number of years ago. Mm -hmm. His junior high band. And it was so out of tune. It was just awful. And I, later, I, I found I saw Curtis in the hall, and I, kept trying, I put my arm around him, and I said, Hey, Curtis, you're one of my boys. Yeah? I said, If you ever bring a band around and plays that out of tune again, I'm going to kick your butt. <laughs> I think you got the message <laughs> because I got to ju judge them at a festival about six weeks later and they had worked pretty hard on intonation it was way good <laughs> and really if you just let it go to pot it'll, that's what you'll get you just have to worry about it yeah. just don't let it don't take don't just let it go to chance you know? balance blend dynamics yeah so much of, of balance and blend is intonation, actually. The more you get everybody playing in tune, the more the balance and the blend starts to work in the section. Yeah, everything, yeah, everything connects. Yeah. To do these are just concert band things too. You know that, and you've yep. got to do the you got to worry about the same things in your horn section and the jazz band. You know, do they have good tone production? Are they playing in tune? Do they balance with each other? I don't have enough fourth trumpet. I need a lot more fourth trumpet. I mean, you're always I'm, I drive like that. Yeah. No, I need more. Put your bell up. Put your bell down like that. I'm never going to hear you. Put your bell up. Point it right out at me. <laughs> and I'll be after him, you know. <laughs> That's another issue in the brass section is lazy people that put their horn their horn down, you know, and there's no point. Where you point your horn makes a really big difference. Yeah, yeah, it really does. It really does. But do you have, um, do you have them point over the stand? Yeah. And, and here's the thing about the stand too. Yeah. A lot of times the stand is looking about like this, you know, and, and they're barely peeking over the stand and the trumpet's in the stand and you can only see their eyes barely over the top of the stand, maybe. Right. <laughs> it's like, no, no, push your stand way down. Well, now I can't see the music. Flatten the tray. Now you can see the music. Keep your stand down there. I want every horn way over the top of the stand. Yeah, okay. Okay, it takes a little practice to learn how to read like that, but you can do it, and that's what you need to do. <laughs> and, yeah, and sometimes I've even gone as far as having a, okay, trumpet player, come up here. <clears throat> okay, I want you to play, and I'll do this a couple of ways. Say, stand behind me, point your bell at my back and play. Okay, mm -hmm. now stand over here and play the same thing. Phenomenal difference. What's going to happen then if your bell is right into the trombone player's head? <laughs> He's going to hear you, but nobody else will. You know? yeah. Now I've done the same thing with a music stand. I'll bring up a player, put the music stand in the front, play, and it's like they're behind the stand. And I'll say, okay, now play the same thing. I'll pull the stand out of the way. It's like... And the, the rest of the section is like, oh, my gosh, that really does make a big difference. Right, yeah. <laughs> and after you've illustrated that, it's like you don't have to worry about it quite so much because everybody really, although you still have to remind them. <laughs> yeah, but, but then they get it because it's been demonstrated. That makes sense. So exactly. when it comes to the trombones, because you don't want to do the same thing with the trombones, right, because they're sitting. Or do you do this? Do, I mean, obviously, you don't want them playing in the stand, but do you have them lower it and flatten it out the same way the trumpets do? Or Yeah, and a lot of times they'll put it a little more over to this to this side, I guess it is, so that there's, it's not in the way of the slide. Oh, slide. Yeah. But, uh, yeah, because I don't want the bell, and I don't want the bell behind any anything, not behind a person and not behind a stand. Yeah, and, yeah. And that's why in the setup, of the, and you'll see this in the, I think it's Appendix A, but in the setup, I always insist that my riser is 16 inches because every jazz festival I've ever gone to, the riser is 8 inches, and it's like, who thought that was a good idea? <laughs> you sit on an eight inch riser and you're still playing right into the back of the saxophone head. Mm -hmm. You know, you're not. And then if I have a situation like that, or for some reason I have to sit flat without a riser, I have the band stagger so that here's my five saxes and the trombones are coming right through the, the holes between the saxes. Yeah. 
<laughs> and the trumpets are standing because and they're getting over the top of the trombone. But what I normally want is a 16 inch riser because that's enough lift now to get the trombones over the saxophones. Okay. And so it's not just visual. I think it does look better visually too, but it's not just visual, it's sonic. You know, there's a sound difference if you get them over the top of that. And the same thing, the, the trump, but I don't usually put a, a short riser for the trombones and then a higher riser for the trumpets because I normally have my trumpet section stand. Yeah. And so I put the same level of riser for the trombones and the trumpets. The difference is the trombones are sitting on it and the trumpets are standing on it. And that gives me that terrace effect and it's about the same, it's about the right distance, about the right height differences to get the sound through. Mm -hmm. But you'll find a lot of people that don't get that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. You go to another school for your region jazz festival, and there's a stupid eight inch riser. I said, no, I, I want to, you know, it's too late. <laughs> yeah, I, I've been wanting to get some risers for our school. We don't currently have any. Yeah. Um, well, if not, then I would, like I say, stagger. Put your trombones in between yeah. those pieces. Yeah. Yeah. We can. Make sure that you've got a clear shot to get their sound out without being behind a saxophone. Right. <laughs> yeah. uh, and for some reason, that just brought up another thought in my mind. I've seen this happen. You've got the band set up, and here's the rhythm section over on this side. It's backwards for you, what I'm doing here. So I, rhythm section's over on this side. Mm. And in my mind, whenever the soloists, whenever you have an improvised solo, that soloist it come, has to come up and be in the rhythm section because now it's not a big band anymore, it's a combo. Yeah. The, the, suddenly the rhythm section is functioning more like they would in a combo with the soloist and they're trying to hear and work with the soloist, you know, like a combo would. And they need to come up and be in with the rhythm section. But I've so often seen this set up where they've got a mic on the opposite side of the band. And like this kid comes out of the trumpet section and he stands on the opposite side of the band in the mic from the rhythm section. They can't hear him. You can't hear them. I mean, yeah. it's ridiculous. It's like, what are you doing? Come <laughs> over with the rhythm section. <laughs> yeah, that makes sense. That makes sense. Yeah. <laughs> so setup things do make a difference. Mm -hmm. And I always try to set up the rhythm section so that the drummer's in front of the trumpet section. He's actually going to be fairly parallel to the drum trombone section probably. Okay. I want him to be where he can hear trumpets because your trumpet s section and your drummer have to be joined at the hip and work really together a lot. Your drummer's going to be punching those figures and setting up those figures for your trumpet section. He needs to be able to hear them. Yeah. Some years ago, I had a lead trumpet player in synthesis that would not hold a sectional unless the drummer would be there. Hmm. I want the drummer at my sectionals, and they would work together, you know, <laughs> which is yeah. a good thing, actually. It's hard, harder to pull that off. <laughs> right. Yeah, but I can see how that'd be valuable. Cool. Yeah, yeah. and so <clears throat> I, I want the drummer to be forward. I don't want him sitting farther back and he's behind the trumpets. I want him to sit forward. Mm -hmm. And then the bass player will be next to him. Some people put the bass player on the hi-hat side. Uh, some people even put them up on the, uh, on the riser with the band. That's okay. I mean, Count Basie did that. For It's not all bad. But I usually tend to put the bass player on the opposite side. Now he's by the ride cymbal. They can really try to line up those quarter notes. And uh, the piano player is just right there, the lid open. And we've got the bass player works so much with the drums, but he also works so much with the piano harmonically yeah. and rhythmically with the drums. And having that bass player there makes more sense to me. But uh, anyway, and then I have the guitar player next to the piano, so there's some eye contact and stuff. We can talk about rhythm section next week, but okay. there needs to be eye contact. And sometimes I've seen like the guitar players back behind the drums, and here's the piano, and there's no way they have any communication with each other. Mm -hmm. So, anyways, setup things do matter. I went into a band room, <laughs> Mountain View High School, actually, many years ago, and they've got a terraced band room, and so. Okay. The drummer was like up two terraces, you know, and sitting on this, and, he, and that's where he could get enough width to kind of put up his set. Yeah. Well, there wasn't any more room on that, so the bass player was like another, another one or two behind him, 
-hmm. And then the piano was pushed up against the wall at the front of the room. So it was an upright piano in the back. It was pushed up against the wall. Yeah. And, and then the guitar player was kind of over in left field. And it's like, there's no way that rhythm section is ever going to work together. Yeah. <laughs> you have to be able to see each other and feel each other and hear each other. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Anyway. These seem like small issues, but they actually end up being fairly important issues. And so similarly, it's most common to set your bass trombone player and your baritone sax on the same side of the same side of the band, where they can work together because they have a lot of stuff together. Mm -hmm. They need to be able to hear each other. Um, most people set them up on the right side of the band, and then the bass would be on the left side. But they have to work with the bass too. I used to always set up the band with the bass trombone and the baritone sax next to the rhythm section. Mm -hmm. So they could work with the bass, and I, I like that actually. But but we got into so many troubles when we were touring overseas, and the stage was so small that I couldn't get my lead tenor out to come over with the rhythm section. Mm. We'd have so many solos that I finally threw in the town and said, "Okay, lead tenor sit next to the rhythm section. We put yeah. the berry on the other side. Therefore, the bass trombone's going to be on the other side too." Okay. <laughs> Usually, it's better if your soloists are near you near your rhythm section if possible. Yeah, no, I can move as far. I like my soloist to come out front, but yeah. sometimes certain kind, especially the dance gigs we do, the solos are short. You don't have time to get out and back. You just, they need to be near the rhythm section. So.